Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg UK. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Paris with a special focus this week on finance in the UK and Europe. Now, over the next half an hour, we're here in the French capital. It's increasingly in the corporate spotlight after Brexit, and I'm here for JP Morgan's Global Markets Conference. So we'll have plenty of interviews, and of course, we'll look at the markets. Later, we'll bring you our exclusive interview with the bank's chief executive officer, Jamie Dimon. That's at 1.15 p.m. London time. And then a little bit after that, back in the UK, of course, we know it's decision day from the Bank of England. They're expected to raise rates another time. And we'll bring you our interview with the governor, Andrew Bailey, later today. And that's at 4 p.m. London time. But let's start with a catch up on the markets. Let's begin with Mark Badrachani, JP Morgan Securities Head of Global Sales and Research. Mark, as always, thank you so much for coming on. Markets are all over the place. We have investors, we have a lot of analysts saying, look, a recession is near, a credit crunch is, is arriving, people are hiring less, and yet the markets are range bound. What's your feeling? You're absolutely right. First, welcome to Paris, Francine. You know the city well. We, were, we had you last year, we have you this year. We have more than a thousand people this year. I think, for, and for the first time, people are coming back from Asia. Like last year with COVID, they were not. So with that said, as you, as you said, and you have Jamie later on, you look at all the bad news out there and there are plenty. You have debt ceiling in the US, you have regional banks, you have inflation, you have the Bank of England later today. So you have many reasons, and our clients are telling us we have many reasons to be negative. Having said that, every day that goes by, the market goes a bit higher. So the question is, what do people really think? They think there is recession and should go lower. What is happening is probably not exactly the same. So I don't really understand market behavior. Is yeah. it because people are still fully invested? It's because Is it because of the private marks and the fact that there's still no real alternative? Or is so it really is a, that... It's a great question. And if you remember last year, we talked about what people were thinking about commodities. Yeah. And I made the, the point be, making the difference between what people think and what people express in their investment. So we had a survey this morning at the conference. A lot of people are still invested in cash. A lot of people see, when you look at the fixed income markets, rates and commodities to a certain extent, they're pricing a recession. Equities is not. Now, I, I went to uh, Middle East a few weeks ago. I went to Latin America between New York and London. Everybody thinks the same. Equity markets are too high. But Yet, no one does anything no about it. No, but then you have to ask yourself the question is, do they think they're too high because they would like to invest more? Or do they think they're too high because if you look at rationally and objectively at all the risk out there, they are too high. What, what is the chance of the mother of all crash com coming in our face, given so all these idiosyncrasies? That's the million dollar question. If you're the glass half empty person, you look at all these things happening around the world and you think something is going to crack. And the second question that our client asks us is, what are we not seeing? Is it commercial real estate? Is it the debt ceiling? Is it something else that is more systemic in the market? Today, we don't see anything systemic. That doesn't mean we're right. Then you have the glass half empty, a half full version, which is say, we have a war. We had the biggest energy crisis in the world. We have tension between Russia and China. We had the biggest pandemic, yet the global economy is doing well. So, but, so what are your clients saying? Because you also look at the debt ceiling. And we were, you know, last night being briefed by your head of research, Joyce Chang, on, on the U.S. default potential that not many people understand. Certainly the market at the moment seems to be ignoring it. So clients are worried and clients are afraid to, uh, the level of conviction is relatively low. So yesterday we had a round table with credit investors, the two biggest themes, debt ceiling and uh, regional banks in the U.S., if you had the similar dinner in the U.S., people would talk still that ceiling would be one. They would have a much more negative view about Europe from the U.S. than in, in Europe. You look at Paris, you walk around, like, A, people yeah. now speak English in restaurants, and B, restaurants are full. And less so, rude yes. sometimes. Less rude, absolutely, yeah. And so what does that mean? I, mean? I don't know whether we look at a world where everything's a bit more fragmented or whether there's just a misunderstanding between the regions which create opportunities. I, I think the one thing that has changed compared with the past is that central banks are much more quick in acting. So every time you have a bump in the road, whether it was LDI in the UK or the regional banks in the US, the central banks are very quick to act, sometimes quite impactfully, I mean, very always impactfully, but sometimes very forcefully. And therefore, you could imagine a scenario where 
unlike what we had pre-08, where we were like boom and bust, you could have scenarios where every time there is a, a little adjustment, you have an adjustment on the market. Having said all that, I do believe like today there is a bit of a decorrelation between the fixed income market and the equity market. So something has to give and something have, uh, have to adjust. Uh, do you worry that central banks were too quick to act or if not quick to forceful to act so that there's a lag in monetary you know, like, policy? It's very easy to criticize the central banks ex ante. Like, the reality is it's a very, like, it's a com very complicated work. Were they too slow uh, to act on inflation? Looking back, absolutely. Where they should they have done more? But if you're the Fed today, it's a very fine balance between fighting inflation and until what level are you uh, will you be ready to accept? If inflation were to settle at three percent, is that acceptable or not? And not hurting the financial system, especially with the regional banks. So for them, finding that equilibrium is probably very uh, difficult. And again, investor, I mean, inflation, understand. So we focus a lot on what central banks do yes. without really understanding what inflation will do. So we're, we're looking no, at the that, problem, right? Thing. But you see, when you talk to clients, they're probably less concerned about inflation today than they were, say, six months ago, because they've seen a decline in inflation. The UK probably, yes, yeah. it's still sticky. Yeah. It's still at a high level. Yeah. But from an investor point of view, they say, OK, we're on the right trend. OK, yeah. then in that now. As we know, inflation, and it was funny, like uh, sitting, spending time in Brazil and Mexico, when you speak to clients, say, no, you guys don't understand what inflation is. It will take a while. And they're right. Okay, and probably in the West, in the US and in Europe, we're hopeful that inflation will go down quicker than it really is. But it's on the right track, and therefore you have reasons to be optimistic there. So uh, we also spoke to a number of you know big, big investors in France over the last couple of days. Is, is refinancing a problem? I know we always talk about commercial real estate, but the fact that interest rates have gone up so much, are, how much stress in certain parts of the market is there going to be? There will be stress in the market. So one area that people are very focused on is commercial real estate. But then once you unpeel the onion in commercial real estate, you have office and you have the rest. You could say, well, office is very challenged, especially with uh, working from home uh, model. The reality is, if you have an office in San Francisco, yes, that's very challenged. If you have the same office space or newer office space in Miami, you're okay. Like, you, you're oversubscribed. So even there, you're, uh, it's very hard to distinguish the two. The other thing is, it will take time. It's not like you have a wall of refinancing overnight. All these things happen over time. And you have deep, deep pockets sitting on the sideline, like PE firms uh, and uh, sponsors, who probably see it as an opportunity. So the last time I spoke to you, there were a, a num a, other challenges. Yes. Are you a, a glass half full kind of guy? Because actually, so, so we saw the banks, JP Morgan played a role in this with First Republic. There was, of course, ETFs, there was Credit Suisse. But overall, the system has helped. The system has helped. And overall, if you see, like, Credit Suisse getting bought by UBS, a few regional banks uh, going under in the US. Despite all that, the system is functioning well. And even when we look at what happened last year, you had like S&P going down quite a bit and in a relatively orderly way. And every time you had a bump in the road, I yeah. think between the market players and the central bank, it ended up in a good way. So I am a glass half full guy, especially when I travel. I think it's kind of, and if you haven't been lately, go to the Middle East. You like it's that's probably the high uh, the the high end in terms of how positive you can feel. But even in uh, countries yeah, without China, oil. yes, but oil even gas. with yes, not all of them, and even with oil coming down, I think you like the word is. Yeah. And again, as I told you, biggest pandemic, you have a war, you have tension between U.S. and China, you have the debt ceiling. Despite all that the global economy is growing. Uh, Mark, it's also a decision day for the Bank of England. And what do you do with, with the UK? I don't know whether, you know, there, there's a strong inflation. I think there's... So strong, like, inflation is probably more challenging in the UK because you have a combination of everything that's happening in the world and Brexit and transition. Uh, and you had a change of governments. I think our house view is uh, they hike by 25 basis points, split vote 7-2, probably another hike in June. Uh, 
we'll see. It's kind of the the like we're confident. We we see like the you look at uh, London. It's vibrant. There's still things happening. So it will it probably take a bit longer, but they will get there. Do, do clients ask you about the UK or you know? Less you so. So if you're here in on the continent, probably are people are probably less focused on the UK. In the US, they would. In the Middle East, they absolutely uh, uh, do. And London remains the number one. Uh, uh, finance place in, in, in Europe. So I think that's where it's happening. Now, Paris is a big hub for us. We have 800 people. We have to have that. We have to service our clients. But it's kind of, and we work well between the two. Is, is there, are we underestimating actually a lot of the geopolitics with China? Yes, and I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll discuss that uh, with Jamie tonight. That's the biggest concern for our clients. So today, the two, when we did the poll, number one biggest concern was uh, geopolitics. Especially since, when you look at it, you have uh, tension escalating between the U.S. and China almost by accident more than by design until you had the uh, Biden-Xi uh, summit. Think things have escalated from what we hear, from what we see, what our clients believe is like that's definitely the biggest risk out there. And clearly, people would like to see a resolution on Ukraine. Yeah, and it's difficult to trade, actually. Geopolitics, the problem is that traditionally... Oh, almost impossible to trade. It's impossible. So impossible. Do, do you... We had a question on China, if people were investing in China, wanted to invest more. And if you look at the answers, it goes from uninvestable to I don't, I'm underweight, I need to increase my exposure. Mark, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Mark Bajuchani there, the J.P. Morgan Securities Head of Global Sales and Research. Now, we'll have plenty more from here throughout the day. Coming up, Paris reaps Brexit benefits as it seeks to take London's limelight as Europe's biggest finance hub. So we discuss that next with our Yonel Laurent. This is Bloomberg. I would definitely think that uh, Paris is probably the best uh, position city and France country in establishing the new continental financial services up, definitely from an asset management perspective. We uh, invested quite a lot in Europe and we decided to establish a sales and trading hub in Paris. Brexit has been, in my view, an accelerator, but the reason why Paris is so well positioned now, it, it dates uh, probably 10 years, 20 years back. We worked on the legal framework, on the fiscal framework, uh, so that it could be a place to attract uh, new investments. Uh, and we have seen the, the effect huh, concretely. Huh? So more and more banks or financial institutions are joining uh, Paris. The strike, you know, is not unique to Paris or France. I think we had waves of strike across Europe. I don't think strike will obviously put at risk any investors going forward. There's clearly the bad image, but then the real substance is uh, the infrastructure and the ecosystem that has been built over time. It's a very diverse uh, in terms of financial services that come into play in Paris. And I think what is important is we continue to see investments in Paris and investors growing there. Uh, business leaders there and how Brexit has actually benefited uh, Paris. Uh, now, joining us now, Bloomberg Opinion columnist Lionel Laurent. Lionel, first of all, it's very exciting because I think it's this week that you launch a Paris edition of the newsletter and so you'll be focused on finance and trying to figure out really how France is benefiting from Brexit. So we're here, I mean, JP Morgan does a conference here, a lot of the other banks. How, how much has it benefited? Uh, hugely, hugely. I mean, Paris has had, uh, obviously, jobs and capital coming from London. Brexit was the big uh, starting point because U.S. Uh, global banks had to have a base on the continent. What's fascinating, though, is that Brexit is only part of the story. Obviously, Macron had uh, pro-business reforms that made France a better place uh, to do business. But also, COVID changed the game immensely because remote work and having local hubs started to make business sense for the banks, and Europe was more integrated after COVID. So it's a lot of catalysts, with Brexit being the biggest. But, Leona, I guess the question is, what kind of numbers are we looking at? So, of course, if you have to service your clients, and if you have some top earners that you want to keep happy, and they don't want to go to Frankfurt, or they don't want to go to Amsterdam, and they want to come to Paris, you keep them here. But does it make business sense? hiring here because it's so difficult to then restructure, for example, the organization or the union if something were to happen. 
I think the direction of travel is just unmistakable because I think uh, now we're seeing a model where uh, bankers want to be face to face with their clients on the continent and they are happy with uh, checking with their, with their colleagues via Zoom, remotely or other ways. I think the model has changed. I think that's not going back because transport costs, inflation have gone up. The European talent pool is now accessible really only from, from Europe. So I think local models today make more sense for banks, even if overall they would not have wanted Brexit to happen. They like efficiency. So, so how does Paris you know, have an advantage over Frankfurt or other financial hubs in Europe? I think Paris is, is, has the advantage of being centralised. It has big mega cap companies. It has uh, the biggest banks in Europe. It has obviously culture and schools. Basically, it's a place where bankers actually want to live and work as opposed to the place where they feel they have to go just to keep their job. And at the same time, you know, you've been writing some great columns, of course, on some of you know, the, the strengths of some of the French banks. Again, they've been outperforming some of the rest of Europe. What are the French banks getting right compared to the Italians or, or the Germans? Well, I think overall, uh, Europe is economically doing better than anyone thought after COVID and after the, the energy crisis and the Ukraine war. I think what's happening now is we need to see that continue. We need to see the real economy. I mean, if Paris has to benefit more, the, the, the French economy has to keep growing. And that's the challenge, really, for the outlook. You know, can Macron keep reforming and keep investing? That's the big question. Yeah. We saw, frankly, Paris burning. We saw a lot of the reforms with people on the streets, a lot of public anger. D does that influence you know, bankers wanting to live here? And does it make companies think twice about creating a larger hub here? Well, you know France, I know France. It, pension reform is tough everywhere. We're seeing strikes everywhere. I'm, I think that is seen as a, as a temporary thing because fundamentally income inequality is relatively low in France. Inflation looks better in France than even in, in the UK. I think the question is, all of this depends on French debt and French government support. How is that going to continue if debt is being stretched as a proportion of GDP and if Macron is politically constrained? So that, that's the issue for the future. But how difficult is it actually for President Macron? So I remember his famous speech saying, look, we're going to roll out the red carpet for entrepreneurs, but also uh, some of the bankers. How difficult is it, as, as a former hedge fund guy himself, is it to help finance, you know, come to Paris while dealing with this huge you know, social unrest and cost of living crisis? I think it's difficult, but the, the political story and the economic story are diverging in France. Politically, no question, there's gridlock in France. Macron has a huge uphill struggle to get his reforms through. But economically, you just have to admit that France is not doing too badly relative to other countries. That's part of why bankers stay here and think there's a reason to stay here. It's not just Macron rolling out the red carpet, it's the rest of the economy. So, Luna, I'm excited about your newsletter. I think it comes out tomorrow for the first time. What time? Uh, so it's coming out Saturday. We're doing a, a, a kind of weekend takeover of the Brussels so edition. <laughs> no, no, we work 24-7 at Bloomberg, even in Paris. We're going to take over the Brussels edition newsletter, and it's going to be a weekly roundup of everything you need to know from the ground, local knowledge, but with a global perspective, uh, news, views, markets, finance, economics, luxury, the whole gamut from Paris, but for a global readership. Great. I'm going to subscribe. You subscribe, right? You go online, you like log in and subscribe. Yes. There you go. Lionel, thank you so much thank for joining you. us. Lionel Laurent from Bloomberg Opinion, and now newly minted newsletter in charge as well. Coming up, we'll discuss what the future holds for London after a barrage of criticism from some city leaders. We'll have a full roundup of that critic criticism and those critics next. This is Bloomberg. JP Morgan's top executive in Europe says Brexit has cannibalized, cannibalized the London's listing pool. Now, data compiled by Bloomberg actually shows listings in the English capital have raised just $18 million so far this year. That's less than 1% of Europe's total. Now, Will Shaw from our finance team joins us now. Will, what does the future then look like for London? And good morning. Good morning. So I think the first thing to say is that London remains by far the biggest financial centre in Europe still as a major caveat and that's in terms of staff numbers, assets and volumes of business. However, like you say, there are signs of trouble at the mill in terms of listings and equity capital markets. 
Um, there are a few different reasons for that. Uh, particularly geopolitical reasons, you know, as we know, Russian listings have, have dried up. China tends to be more domestically focused. But whenever you're talking about UK, the UK, you obviously have to factor in Brexit. And as um, Viz Raghavan, who's JP Morgan's chief executive for Europe, the Middle East and Africa, uh, was saying on this programme a few days ago, uh, Brexit has effectively cannibalised the London listing pool. Yeah. So, well, I guess the question is, there are many firms that could have IPO'd in London who basically said, no thanks. I mean, what's a step forward? So the, I think the big one here to look at is Revolut as a, as a bellwether for what's going on. Now, their co-founders gave a very outspoken interview to The Times just a few days ago. They said they had no intention of listing on the London, London Stock Exchange. They had a laundry list of problems that they pointed to. Um, they said the regulatory environment was unclear, which made things uncompetitive completely, uh, um, particularly when compared with the United States. They talked about red tape, about high taxes, and a skills shortage uh, from Brexit. Um, so generally, you know, there is a sense there is a sense of pessimism around listings in the UK. Again, I'd come back to that caveat. You know, a lot of the talk at the moment is about Paris, about how Fran how well France is doing. Um, the UK yeah. remains like very dominant in terms of financial services. Well, thanks so much. Will Shaw there from our finance team. Now, don't forget also to listen to our podcast and you can subscribe to In the City as well. It's one I host with Dave Merritt and you can find Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcast. New episodes drop every Thursday and today we talk about some of uh, the CBI scandals. A reminder, BOE decision, that's at 12 p.m. London time and then we have a special interview with the governor. This is Bloomberg.